Good morning, uh, church family. Glad to be with you again on the study of the Gospel of Mark. Some of you that are closer friends of mine know that I'm a big Abraham Lincoln fan. Uh, I've read a lot of the biographies of him and read a lot of his papers. I'm fascinated by how God called that man to be the president at, at the particular time that he did. A couple of sessions ago, I mentioned to you one of his great speeches is called the House Divided Speech, and it was when he was running for the Senate in Illinois against Stephen Douglas, and he quoted from Mark 3. He was a man who quoted the Bible quite often and, and read it quite often and, and let the scriptures speak to him. In that Senate race, when he was running against Stephen Douglas, he lost. And much like you might see in the paper today, he won the popular vote but lost the, the other side of the deal. And so he lost the race in a very close race to Stephen Douglas. And somebody asked him how he felt about that. And this was his quote. He says, I feel like the boy who stubbed his toe. I'm too big to cry and I hurt too badly to laugh. Uh, the pain of rejection. I heard an athlete say one time, why is a boo so much louder than a cheer? Uh, when folks are against you, when people turn against you, when people reject you, it hurts and it hurts a lot. And we're going to see that in the life of Jesus today out of Mark 6. If you grab your Bible, it will be Mark 6. We'll start in verse 1. Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. And when the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many heard him were amazed. When they did this, uh, where did this man get these things, they said? What's this wisdom that he has been given? What are these remarkable miracles that he's performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James and Joseph, Judas and Simon? Are on his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own town, among his relatives and in his own home. He could not do many miracles there except lay hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. Jesus experiences rejection. The Bible says uh, he's tempted in all ways just like we are. And I guess that includes the temptation and the hurt that comes when we are rejected by other people. Have you ever been rejected by people? This rejection was part of the Old Testament prophecy about Jesus. He even quoted it in Matthew 21. He says, have you never read in the scripture the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? It was part of the, the messianic prophecy that he would be rejected by his own people. John 1 says this, The true light that gives light to everyone who is coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. And he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. This rejection was part of the Old Testament prophecy, and the Jews rejected him as their Messiah. It's kind of part of this same thing we talked about out of Mark 4, this sin against the Holy Spirit, this blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, when you reject Jesus as your Savior. It's kind of that same thing. Uh, I sometimes think we kind of gloss over this idea of rejection as far as Jesus and how he felt about it. Mark 3 tells us that his own family rejected him. They had doubts about him. They even said he was out of his mind. And Jesus was rejected by his own hometown. Imagine being rejected by your family, and now today in this one, in this chapter, he's rejected by his hometown, by his neighbors. I wonder how that affected him. He's fully human, and he's fully God. The Bible says he learned obedience through what he suffered, and I'm thinking that this rejection was part of what he suffered. It got me thinking, are there lessons that we need to have for ourselves when we feel rejected by other people? You know, I pray for our teenagers, for our kids a lot, as they face rejection. Uh, among their peers because they've decided to be a Christ follower. And I pray for all of us as we live lives that are so different from the world that our neighbors might reject us or at least think differently about us or maybe a little standoffish about us because we've decided to be a Christ follower. Jesus said over in John 15, If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, you it would love you as its own, but it, as it is, you do not belong to the world. I have chosen you out of the world. This is why the world hates you. It's almost like a promise that if we are faithful to Jesus and faithful to God, some people are going to reject us. found something new this week as I was studying this. This account in Mark 6 seems to actually be Jesus' second time to go to Nazareth. Um, sometimes when we're reading the Gospels, it's hard to figure out the chronology of it all. And there's people a lot smarter than I have gone back and done that. And those guys tell me that 
in Luke 4, Jesus went to Nazareth almost right after his baptism, after his wilderness temptation. He went to his hometown, and this is out of Luke 4. He says he went to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue and was as it was his custom, and he stood up and read out of the scroll of Isaiah, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. You know that great passage? And it says, All spoke well of him and were amazed at his gracious words that came from his lips and said, Isn't this Joseph's son? And it was all going well for the hometown boy there in Luke 4. And it kind of implies that he taught in the synagogue quite often because of his, uh, his um, ability to do so. But then Jesus gets kind of pointed in his teaching, and he says, you know what? Israel's not as special as they thought they were. Uh, God reached out in the time of Elijah and um, healed a, a, uh, a Gentile widow's son. And then in the time of Elisha, he healed Naaman, a Gentile general. Don't think you're so special, Israel. God is working with the Gentiles too. And this is what happened. They said all the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up and drove him out of town, and they took him to the brow of the hill from outside the city in order to throw him off of a cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. As is often the case, admiration turns quickly to rejection. Not just rejection, but they actually try to kill him here. So how does that relate back to the Mark 6 story? Where This is his second time in Nazareth. Jesus is giving his hometown a second try, a second chance. We might call that an act of grace. He wants to give them another chance to accept his teaching and embrace him as the Messiah. That's a lesson for us, that people get second chances. He goes back to this same place, this same synagogue where they threw him out before, and he again uses this phrase, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown. That proverb is true for us today as well. I want you to think about uh, all those who knew you best when you were a knucklehead teenager. <laughs> uh, when my son was a, uh, was a young man, so you used to tell him all the time he had a frontal lobe issues because his behavior was just crazy. He was acting like a teenage boy. But now I know some of those boys that used to hang out in my house, and they're all good young men now. They're successful. Their frontal lobes have developed <laughs> Uh, they've become responsible citizens, husbands, dads, businessmen, and I'm a particularly uh, affectionate toward one of those boys who became a successful engineer. That can be our story. It can even apply to preachers and elders and teachers. Some of the guys in my church youth group growing up uh, that are now fine elders and preachers and Christian leaders and dads, they were knuckleheads when we were in the church youth group. Uh, that doesn't say much for the hometown crowd if we're not able to overcome that. If we're not careful, we can miss out much of, on much of what's important in life by, not, by having a very limited vision and the inability to look over and forget and even forgive the past that people have. God working in someone's life can have a transformational power that is bigger than our ability to forget the past and move on. God's working in somebody's life, that transformational power is often bigger than my ability to forget and forgive somebody's past. So we don't want to limit what God can do in the life of other people. And just like Nazareth, uh, everyone deserves a second chance. But having said all that, I don't think that was the case with Jesus here. Jesus was not a rebellious teenager in his growing up years in the hometown, so why did they reject him? If you look at the text, they didn't reject him they were, it says they were offended by him, and they got indignant about it. If you go back into Mark 4, Jesus heals a demon-possessed man. He cures a woman of a disease that she's had for 12 years. He raises Jairus' daughter from the dead. I'm fairly certain this hometown crowd in Nazareth knew those things. The word got out about this boy. And why they didn't carry the day, I'm always amazed at that. It sounds like they're saying, don't confuse me with the facts. I've already got my mind made up. Jesus was not what they wanted him to be, so they rejected him. Their measure was not prophecy. The Old Testament was full of those predictions. Their measure was not the miracle. Their measure was not his compassion. Their measure was not this incredible teaching that he was able to do with such authority. It would be kind of like having Thomas Jefferson come in and have a class on the Declaration of Independence or James Madison come in and teach it on the Constitution. Can you imagine having Jesus, the Son of God, talk to you about the Scriptures and it didn't work? The measure of the hometown crowd was themselves. 
what they wanted, what they needed, what they thought things should be. Arrogance and pride and even ignorance cloaked in religion is a scary thing. Cloaked in orthodoxy is a scary thing. I shared with you a couple of times ago this passage out of John 5 that just haunts me. It says, you study the scriptures diligently because you think in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, but yet you refuse to come to me and have life. This account today made me realize how hard it is to break out of our molds, our thoughts and our beliefs that are so dear to us, but sometimes grounded in things other than scripture. These scribes, these Pharisees, they had the scriptures, the very scriptures that told that the Messiah was coming and that this was the Messiah. And they believed, uh, and, and what they believed was not just the scriptures, but they believed what the political climate was telling them. They believed what the rabbis told them during this 400 years of silence. They were influenced by a lot of things other than the simplicity of the scriptures. Based on the teaching of the rabbis during that time rather than scripture today, today we would say, based on commentaries about the Bible rather than the Bible itself. They studied the scriptures so closely, but they couldn't see the forest for the trees. They couldn't see the Messiah for all their preconceived ideas and traditions. That scares me. He was not what they expected, not what they were comfortable with, and not what they wanted, so they rejected him. Well, thank goodness that doesn't happen today, right? <laughs> Alexander Campbell has a quote that still haunts me. He says, our challenge is to read scripture as if it dropped in our lap for the very first time. I think that's almost impossible to do, but I want to be challenged by that. So Jesus is rejected by his family in his hometown, uh, but there's other kind of rejection in this account as well. Jesus, after being rejected this last time, Jesus rejects them. That's strong language, and I don't even like to use that language. But in verse 5, he said he could do no mighty works there except that he laid hands on a few sick people and healed them. Most of the writers that I studied this week said that that wasn't because he didn't want to. It's because their unbelief was so strong, they didn't bring sick people to him. They had already determined that this wasn't the guy, and so he didn't heal a lot of people because a lot of sick people didn't get to him. I think that's incredibly sad. Can you imagine being so prejudiced against this young man that if you had a sick friend, you wouldn't bring him to him? I'm dismayed by that. And so was Jesus. He says he marveled at their unbelief. That word marveled, or amazed is really should be, in this case, astonished, surprised, or even dismayed. And what does he do? He leaves town. He leaves Nazareth. And I don't even, uh, and, it, and it doesn't appear that he ever goes back here again. One way of saying this is Jesus rejects Nazareth. He's, he tried. He gave them every chance. But when they did not respond, he moved on. And this is his last time in Nazareth because he's headed to Jerusalem and he'll never come back this way again. I wonder what he was thinking as he left his hometown this time, knowing he would not be back, knowing he was headed for the cross. My understanding of him from the Gospels is I would imagine he had a tear in his eye and a lump in his throat as he left Nazareth. Sadness at the rejection, just much like he was as he stood over Jerusalem as he entered during the Passion Week and just wept over Jerusalem. I cannot imagine him leaving his hometown neighbors knowing that they were unbelievers. He had to be sad. And that leads us to these next few verses here of what we call the limited commission. He sends out the 12 apostles on what might be the first mission trip. And it was evidently very successful. Calling the 12 to him, he began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the impure spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals but not an extra shirt. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. And they went out and preached that people should repent. And they drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. I get the idea that Jesus wanted these guys to be focused on this mission trip. Uh, they're not going on a vacation. This is kingdom work and it needs to be done. And evidently, it was a very successful mission trip. But did you get that idea at verse 11? He said, if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet. Shaking the dust off your feet would be like I say, I'm washing my hands of this. I'm done with you. Well, that sounds harsh. Uh, shaking the dust off your feet is saying that those who rejected God's truth would not be allowed to hinder the furtherance of the gospel. 
at some point a determination has determination has to be made that those who don't believe cannot hinder the furtherance of the gospel. And we still have to wrestle with some of those issues today. At some point, you can't let the opposition stop the progress of the gospel. Jesus is saying at some point you have to reject them and move on. This is kind of a hard teaching. This is a tough lesson about rejection for Jesus and what he experienced, but then that there is a time in our life when we make the determination that we reject other people who don't accept the gospel. So I'm, I'm nervous about that. I'm, I'm a little disturbed by that. But I know this. When I make that determination that I'm rejecting someone, as long as I have that tear in my eye and that lump in my throat and that ability to always want to give them a second chance, I'll do okay in that because God will bless that. I hope you've benefited from this time in Mark 6 today. I know I have. Have a good day.